Uh, my name is Andrew Dorman. Welcome to our International Affairs webinar series event on new research on 21st century conflict. I'm delighted we've got a great band, group of speakers and a discussant before you today. Um, it's been great to have them part of the, being part of this. I should first state that the event is on the record and the webinar will be recorded um, and hopefully will be released in, that in, a, in a few weeks' time. Conflict in the 21st century, we may have thought it's gone away, but recent events with um, Ukraine ongoing in Syria and Ethiopia and so forth has highlighted how much conflict and war remains a central part of international relations. So it's great to have some great speakers before us today. How we're going to run the event, I'm going to briefly hand over to each of our participants and they're going to get talk for five, six minutes talking about their pieces. And, and Tracy with it as a discussant, and then I'll open up for Q and A. Um, so feel free to either raise your hand or put questions in the chat, and I will act as uh, and pass on the questions and get feedback from our authors. By way of introduction, we're going to start off with Patrick Berry. He is a UK Research and Innovation Future Leaders Fellow, working on the project Transformation of a Transatlantic Counterterrorism, two thousand and one to twenty twenty five. He's a senior lecturer in security at the University of Bath, a former army officer and NATO analyst. His most recent piece in International Affairs in the March edition is on US Special Forces transformation, post-Fordism and the limits of network warfare. Following up from Patrick will be Dmitry Chernobrov, who is a senior lecturer in media and international politics at the University of Sheffield. He's co-director of the Digital Society Network and a research fellow at the USC Center on Public Diplomacy. He's the author of an, award, of an award winning pop book, Public Perception of International Crises, published by Furness Book, which got the Furness Book Award in 2019. His piece, also in the March edition of, of International Affairs, is, was entitled Diasporas and Cyber Warfare Info Politics, Participatory Warfare, and the 2020 Karabakh War. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Anthony King, a Chair of War Studies at the University of Warwick. His recent publications include The Combat Soldier, Infantry Tactics and the Cohesion in the 20th, 20th and 21st Century, Command to the 21st Century General, and Urban Warfare in the 21st Century. He's worked closely with the British Armed Forces and NATO for over a decade, and he currently holds a Lee Major Research Fellowship. His March 22 edition piece in International Affairs is entitled Urban in Insurgency in the 21st Century. Smaller militaries and increased conflict in cities. Our fourth speaker and, and uh, discussant is Professor of Conflict and Security, Tracy German, based at King's College London. Her research focuses on Russian foreign security policies, particularly Russia's use of force in the post Soviet space, conflict and security in the Caucasus and Caspian regions, and the impact of NATO EU enlargement on Russia's relations with its neighbours. Tracy is also the editor of one of our archival collections celebrating the journal's centenary, looking at war and conflict in international affairs over the last hundred years, and was also the editor of our special edition in July 2019, looking at revisioning, revisioning, revisioning war in the 21st century. And with that, I'm going to pass the floor over to Patrick. Thanks, Andrew, yeah. and um, hello, folks. Uh, so I think what Andrew, the sort of way to dovetail this in with my introduction was that uh, the way Andrew introduced me was that I was originally working on, on, on and I am still working on this project um, trying to explain how counterterrorism has changed um, since 9-11 from an organizational perspective. And um, one of the works that I found really useful in terms of understanding military uh, organizational change over the last 30 odd years is actually Tony King's work on um, post-Fordism and the post-Fordist military, which um, as, a, as a relatively uh, fresh um, lever of the armed services seemed to fit a lot more in my experience of the military rather than say theories of post-modernism uh, or fluid militaries, et cetera, et cetera, just sort of um, seem to be more accurate from my own experience. So I've used that actually theoretically quite a lot. And for the um, for the grant, I was basically uh, had to explain you know, organizational transformation in CT. And one of the, the key things that I was going to use as an example of uh, the networked part of the tenet of post-Fordism, which I'll come on to, was, was special forces and especially US special forces, because I was reading the um, a lot of the books about how the special forces had operated in Iraq and especially 
reading actually the memoirs by um, McChrystal, his two books, uh, General Stanley McChrystal. And these really seem to say that, yes, the, new, the, the US, they really um, were a networked force. Um, and, uh, and I was going to use that as my case study as an example of networked, um, ne you know, basically networked organization. Um, and funny enough, when I was reading through their uh, memoirs, though, I started to realize this doesn't really seem networked to me, actually. And with my sort of post fortis head on, I was, I was like, if you break this down, it starts to see a lot more theoretically to fit in with post Fordism. Now post Fordism basically says that there's it's it's we had Fordism, which was the the way of organizing, you know, industries and, and later on sort of wider society, one would argue governments too, um, through the uh, the system uh, four tenets essentially, centralization, especially of uh, management control, often accompanied in the later stages with decentralization of decision making, um, an integration of core and periphery workforces, uh, and outsourcing to, um, yeah, to basically outsource workforces to save costs, and a network approach to information sharing and supply. That would be the sort of tenets of post-Bordism. Uh, and what I realized when I started to look at the special forces was that uh, US special forces, that uh, although people like McChrystal uh, and a lot of the other, uh, in fact, even, even the door kickers, you know, they thought that they were um, in many respects uh, a network forces or so the, the dark force shaping the, the world order as, as one of them has famously said. Um, I didn't actually see that they were that networked um, when you looked at it. So my argument really in, in the article is just that uh, if you break it down, you can see much more of this post Fordist um, uh, coming through, this post Fordist sort of systematic, not that it was conscientious or anything like that, but there's, there's different examples. So, um, and, and this actually went against what the, the academic literature had, had argued about what we knew about um, Western or US led special uh, forces transformation. Um, and, and so basically what I argue in the piece is just that, you know, there's been a centralization of management control. You saw this in Iraq with the, uh, the joint interagency task force approach and the joint operations center, where um, the idea was basically get as many agencies as we can uh, around the table and get them incorporated into this mission against the Iraqi insurgents uh, and control it. And yet at the same time, with uh, the increased information that this has increased by getting all the relevant and US agencies around the table, uh, decentralizing decision making uh, to act on that intelligence out to the special forces teams. So that was sort of a pretty clear um, centralization, decentralization one. Um, the integration of the core and periphery, what I saw was that I held was that the um, core units were uh, the, in, in this case, were the CT mission focused special forces and the periphery units were all the supporting agencies that came in to help them defeat AQI. And so one of the key tenets again what you saw which seemed to be initially as a network approach but actually is much more about integrating the core with the periphery was the um the basically uh, the posting of uh you know analysts to the front line into the um into the special forces units or uh assets etc so you had nsa teams who were put out right to the front line to help people um etc etc there's lots of examples of this in in the article outsourcing was the one with the sort of most limited um evidence but the, it was and, and some of it's classified but we do know that there's been a um, a big increase in the amount of uh, outsource uh, or use of, of, of outsource workforces um, by the whole of the US military, including the special forces community. And there was some a little bit of data in there on that. And then finally, what I argued really is that the um, the network approach was really evident uh, in this idea of information sharing, where there was a network approach was in the intel and information sharing. And that included from both the analysis side of view of adopting a, 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 you know, a network analysis towards finding and fixing the enemy um, and all the procedures that went in. And there was some innovation there um, in terms of the F3EA um, complex, which I can talk about in questions. Uh, and and, and um, and more importantly, uh, network collection and with new capabilities. So that was what I, I, I sort of argue in the, in the article. I then push it on a little bit to say, what does this mean for, for, for warfare? Um, 
it, for a proper network warfare, that transformation would have had to be an emergent from the bottom up rather than the top down. McChrystal was absolutely crucial in generating it along with the other network or certainly with the other, other service heads. So that's another sort of reason why it, it wasn't networked. And then I say, like, if, if you really take this idea of network warfare to its logical conclusion, um, there's going to be, and both 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 uh, adversaries are, are as um, uh, capable as each other, and um, then there's going to be periods of of complete network uh, failure, where where one system, one network takes down the other guys for a while, and they lose all their situational awareness, and you're going to be operating in the in the dark essentially, which is what a lot of U.S. generals have said. If you if you really take this sort of anti-satellite uh, threat seriously. Um, and so you, I, I sort of what I proposed is another way to think about this is binary warfare, where you have pulses of situational awareness, uh, where you're able to act rapidly, followed by you know complete blackness, where you're operating on your own uh, initiative and not connected to anyone, really. So that's it. I'll, I'll leave it there and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. Dimitri, over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Andrew, for the introduction. Um, so I am a scholar of public perception or international crisis, and um, in this particular um, issue of international affairs, I wrote about diaspora as a cyber warriors during the 2020 Karabakh War. So my research is based on two main premises. One is that modern wars are not confined to the physical battlefields. So today they are accompanied by battles over the narratives. Now, that is not necessarily new in the sense that wars have always been accompanied by propaganda, by, um, by attempts to present um, your side a uh, favorable um, um, view of, of the conflict by trying to use news to mobilize publics, etc. But what is different today in modern conflict is that social media has altered participation. So publics around the world, diasporas, publics from within the conflict zone, they are able to participate in the conflict in unprecedented ways. And we have the rise of remote and participatory warfare, which is waged by anybody with an internet connection. And in that sense, uh, the boundary between civilians and combatants comes under question as to if we count information as part of modern warfare, then how do we count producers of information during war? The second premise is that we need to look not just at the conflict zone in terms of the publics and populations and participants, but also at diasporas and people who are living away from the conflict zone. Um, in this sense, why, why diasporas matter? Very often um, they present uh, relatively big, if, if, if not um, even bigger, uh, proportions of of the, of the population in the conflict zone itself. So for example, the Armenian diaspora, which um, I focused on, um, is at least twice as big as the population of Armenia itself. So it is a massive human resource in um, times of war. And diasporas are very well placed to narrate conflicts to um, outside audiences, to, um, to um, audiences in host nations um, and um, on online audiences. So in that sense, I argue that diasporas play an important role in online global conflict infopolitics. And what I mean by that is the transnational competition over the production of knowledge, information, memory of conflict, um, in which uh, different actors try to amplify different voices and try to determine how the event is going to be remembered and understood um, in, in today's circumstances. So the main question I'm asking in my research is how do diasporas fight online during unarmed conflict in their homeland. And by this, I mean uh, primarily disseminating, producing, engaging with information on social media. Now, the, tit uh, the, the, the title of the paper is about diasporas as cyber warriors. And um, that, uh, that uh, comes from the diaspora's own description of their activities. So my research was based on dozens of interviews with the Armenian diaspora during the, during the Karabakh war. And what they described themselves doing is cyber conflict is cyber war. But that didn't mean them hacking anybody. It wasn't cyber, um, cyber warfare in that sense, for example. But it was primarily um, about um, engaging information, amplifying voices, and disseminating information, mobilizing global public opinion. So the case I look at is the 2020 Karabakh War, which happened between the 27th of September to the 10th of November um, 2020. Um, this conflict is was characterized by relatively low international media attention, um, and that made the diaspora efforts um, even more important because that's 
um, uh, diasporas played a significant role in drawing attention, mobilizing international public opinion. So the key takeaways from, from this project are, first, there was really intensive participation of diasporas in this conflict. Um, it was largely motivated by the perception of media bias and by the perception of the need to win the information war during modern conflict. Secondly, there was an, um, a combination, um, I observed a combination of individual tactics, uh, very intuitive, how, how to post information on social media, how to draw public attention, how to translate events to local audiences, but also the emergence of network tactics. And this is interesting because we, um, I discovered some, some of the diaspora members becoming part of groups, organizing, self-organizing into groups, trying to get hashtags trend, uh, trending, trying to push their, um, uh, the comments of their side to the top in news articles, et cetera. So a very organized effort to, um, to, to, to seek maximum visibility for your side and to drown the opponent through the algorithmic tactics. So social media algorithms became an important part of, of their efforts. Um, there's also um, a certain tension between what diaspora members themselves believed about the conflict and what they presented to the outside world. Many of them were aware that they were reproducing propaganda or they were reproducing, for example, casualty numbers or reports from the Ministry of, of, of Defense, which were questionable or which um, they wouldn't be comfortable in reproducing otherwise. But many felt that, you know, the, the um, the cause necessitated participation, even if that participation meant amplifying propaganda. The broader conclusions that I, brought, uh, that I draw about participatory warfare uh, and modern conflict are that th this war, this online war for the narrative, is increasingly trans transnational. There were examples, for instance, of Russian Armenians battling for the opinion of New York Times readers, or, um, um, or being praised for, um, uh, for uh, impacting the public opinion in Canada, which in turn pressured the Canadian government to stop supplying some of the drone parts through Turkey to Azerbaijan. Secondly, this war is increasingly monological. So every side is, um, so each side was drowning the other in uh, through algorithmic uh, tactics, trying to drown their voice. There was no engagement. There was very little engagement with the other side. There was no argument. There was no interaction. So it was very much about boosting the visibility of one side and completely drowning the opponent. The third conclusion is that um, participatory online war, war for, narr for the narrative, war for information does not stop with the physical war. So we have a very different calendar of violence. Right. The war itself, the physical war, ended on November 10th with, with a ceasefire. Um, the efforts of the diasporas, the efforts of, of the publics to draw public attention, to advocate uh, for particular viewpoints in this war, continue to this day. And finally, this war was largely seen as retaliatory. So online activities, engaging with information, disseminating information, trying to get people to, to care, was largely seen as a necessitated response to tactics which were used by the opponent. Uh, and again, many, many of the participants spoke about, spoke about the roles of bots and automated accounts, um, the state, heavy state investment into social media warfare today, and the need um, for ordinary people, for ordinary diaspora me members to find back. So that's just uh, a quick overview of the study, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dimitri. Can I encourage people to put questions into the Q&A box ready ahead of for when we get to the Q&A discussion? And now over to Tony King. Hey there. Well, thanks, Andrew, and, and thanks to um, everyone listening and to my other panelists and to Tracy German for um, uh, coordinating uh, this talk. Well, look, it's, it's really nice and interesting listening to uh, the previous talkers. And um, although I think there's some diversity in, the, in what we're talking about here, actually, um, I can see some very common threads in them. And I'll try and slightly, if I can, highlight some of these threads towards the end of my little four or five minutes of, of discussion. But I can see some themes that seem to me pretty close, which is about smaller militaries reconnecting, transforming the operational ge geometries and the strate strategic geometries of uh, contemporary conflict in some quite interesting ways. And I think there's some pretty interesting uh, connections between what we're trying to say here. Um, so in terms of my own paper, well, uh, look, the thesis is pretty simple, to be honest, and I think it's a pretty simple paper. Um, I, I obviously got interested, um, uh, like most people in, in war post-Iraq, well, you know, with the 9-11 with the attacks in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so 
you know, my interest was through, during a period, my initial period of interest was during a period in which insurgencies and civil conflicts was the primary uh, form of war. And if we look at the literatures, um, which developed in the social and political sciences and in the military sciences. Um, overwhelmingly over the last 20 years, the interest has been in those kind of conflicts in the land domain. Um, and and uh, my article certainly speaks to that literature. Now I'll come to as well to the issue of Ukraine and maybe in Gorno Karabakh at the, at the end. Um, but if you look within a strand of that literature, one of the key uh, arguments that, be, that starts in the 1990s and then becomes stronger and stronger theme is the urbanization of civil conflict and insurgency, uh, the urbanization of criminality, terrorism, and of course, insurgency itself. And the key arguments you'll find in that, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, is that um, there's two factors, uh, demography, uh, half of us uh, now live in cities, 3.5 billion of us live in cities, um, and so therefore cities are so large and they're so important, uh, and in many cases they're such grim places to live, um, that it engenders an alienation and an immiseration, which is the cause of insurgency. And then they're, they're, they're subsequently perfect places for guerrillas and insurgents to operate. Uh, well, that was, that was the literature, um, and, and it seems to be entirely sensible that that's been the main literature for 20 years. But as I started to do, to do my own research, another aspect came clear to me. And in fact, I've got to admit here, I was pretty surprised people hadn't noticed it before because it seems so obvious to me, um, which was forced numbers. Uh, one of the striking things since the end of the Cold War is the almost global, it's not totally global, but the almost global reduction of state forces, state security forces, state armies. And what I try to argue in this piece is that this third element, um, you know, it seems mundane, very silly, very stupid, very sort of unintelligent, uh, but this third element of just the reduction of forces has a critical role to play in prioritizing urban insurgencies. Why? Because states don't have the security forces, they don't have the police, they don't have the gendarmerie, they don't have the armed forces, the arm, arm, armies to swamp urban areas, urban neighborhoods, streets, as they once did in the 20th century, uh, challenged by guerrillas uh, and insurgents as they as they once were. And, and let's just emphasize, you know, the 20th century was a century in which urban insurgency was very common, but typically states responded to it with mass force and mass compulsion, making it very difficult for insurgents to operate. And my argument in the piece is essentially you get downsized uh, forces in the 20, 21st century. And the result is, especially since it's amplified by the increased size of cities, um, that this becomes a theatre, an environment in which once unfavoured and unfavourable for insurgents, um, it now becomes a favoured site. And in fact, very favoured, because from urban enclaves, you're very close to the centres of political power um, to, and, your, and the propagandas of the deed that you can make um, are much more effective in those urban areas. So what we've seen over the last 20 years, I, I argue in the paper, is a rise of urban insurgency, not just because of demography, not just because of the asymmetric advances the city poses, they always existed, but principally because of the uh, downsizing of the forces. Now, where's this relevant in terms of what Patrick and Vinci say? Well, I think there's two things that are relevant. One, note how Patrick's talking about post-Fordist forces. What is the central element of a post-Fordist force uh, in the post-Cold War period? It's that it's downsized and it's reduced itself to a core, a smaller core of professionals. Patrick's excellent article is about that, the, the innermost bit of that core, namely, namely special forces. But what we might say is that a post Fordist military is one that's very likely to have to operate in the urban environment because it's so small. Now, this also, the urbanization of insurgencies and indeed interstate conflicts as we've just seen, uh, and, and as Dimitri talks about, is also interesting because even as um, the urban theater becomes uh, more important and more intense insurgencies open up in terms of particular cities, so there's more intense fighting in particular cities, simultaneously, and Dimitri said it really eloquently, those local fights 
um, proliferate across the urban archipelago, uh, the, the global urban archipelago, typically along lines of diasporic, ethnic or political affiliation, and especially, as Dimitri said, uh, in terms of um, uh, social media has become very important and very useful uh, as this method, message. So you get this really interesting geography of the urban insurgency today, localised, much more intense in the urban environment as the insurgents sustain enclaves and, and are difficult to clear for state forces, but simultaneously recruiting and mobilising and um, uh, and enacting uh, a, a network of supporters and recruits uh, uh, across that uh, archipelago. So what it suggests is that there is a, you know, there's really close um, thematic relationship between the three pieces of work. Final point, um, Ukraine war. I mean, what's interesting, and of course, talking about the second Angorno Karabakh war starts it, but from sort of autumn uh, 2020, right, and, and especially with the Ukraine war, um, that paradigm of civil conflict insurgency, which seems to have been and, and was primary uh, for 25, 30 years, you know, certainly temporary at least, is going into recession as good old fashioned interstate war and all its horrors comes back. Now, I still think the themes that we're talking about are absolutely relevant. Smaller forces create different geometries in that kind of interstate war. But we are talking a different kind of uh, process, a different kind of dynamic. Thank you, Tony. That's great. Tracy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Andrew. And thank you to um, all three of um, our speakers. I'm going to just kind of attempt to bring together the three papers um, and, and just highlight a couple of the themes that I um, kind of felt that come out from all three of them. Um, and actually, Tony has, has brought out some of the common threads um, and, you know, brought together, I think, really well, some of the, the, the commonalities in all three of these papers, all three contribute to our understanding of warfare, how the character of war is changing in the 21st century. And obviously, it's a it's a commonality isn't it uh, one of the enduring features of conflict over the centuries has been its state of flux um and i think this is largely because we see war as a a social construct it's about interaction between different communities and therefore it changes in line with the tools that those communities have access to um, and something that Clausewitz himself um, was very aware of. So what we see today, this rapid technological development, um, you know, connectivity, both in terms of um, access to information, but also um, travel infrastructure, et cetera, big data, the rise of cities, all of which are shaping the future and impacting the character of war, who fights where and how, and how states seek to adapt their forces to meet the challenges of contemporary war and conflict, something I think that all three of these articles look at and, and um, you know, characterise very well. The, the increasing complexity, I think, of the, the global security environment today makes it very difficult for states to plan for future wars. Um, and something that we might like to reflect on, I think perhaps um, moving forwards, is what we can take away from the current conflict in Ukraine, the current war in Ukraine, um, and what we were thinking about the character of conflict before February 2022 um, and now, and I think there's some questions to be answered there about the focus on technology and technological advances versus mass and manpower and whether that balance is correct. Um, the sheer pace of change that we've seen in you know, technological communications technologies, as well as this growing interconnectedness of societies um, has really added to the complexity um, of the international environment, how states deal with this complexity. And I think that's something that Patrick article, Patrick's article examines very well. Um, you know, how states seek to um, you know, uh, organize their armed forces to deal with 
um, the challenges of contemporary war. Technological convergence um, means that um, a much larger number of actors have um, greater access to disruptive and often high-end technology. And Dimitri's article on the 2020 Karabakh War, Cyber Warriors, um, and the, you know, the role of the diaspora in narratives, I think really emphasize the ability of actors and individuals to produce their own digital content communicated across state boundaries um, and have an unprecedented impact. I think information is no longer just an enabler. Um, it can be, you know, and often is used as a weapon that can have an impact across the level, be it strategic right down to the tap tactical and it's something I think when we did the special issue in 2019 looking at the changing character of conflict this idea that the cognitive realm has become a battle space was something that came out from a number of the papers then um the, the this kind of manipulation of information um is nothing new however and, and Dimitri raised that um what is new as he said is the role of social media and this kind of increasing difficulty of distinguishing between friend and foe, between combatant, non-combatant, and that has made it so much more difficult um, to deal with an adversary, who is an adversary, and identify when you're at war. Um, this traditional binary distinction between war and peace is often unclear. But again, this is something, uh, you know, this was an assumption, I think, that we all made pre-February 22, but has that changed um, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine? It's, it's very clearly um, a war. Um, so I think there are a number of questions there about what constitutes the use of force in the 21st century and the continue, continuing effectiveness of traditional armed forces. And then finally, you know, Tony's article drawing attention to the post-Cold War reduction in national armed forces, the impact of this on actors, both adversaries and others, strategic calculus, their decision-making process, and you know, the unintentional signaling that sometimes occurs. You know, we see the experience of individual states fostering different visions of future conflict, how states envis envisage force being used. Um, and I think this stresses really that the fundamental difficulties of predicting the precise nature of, of the next war or future conflict. As I said, I, I feel that the war in Ukraine has demonstrated this. Um, the focus in the UK and the West was on hybrid warfare, gray zone, sub-threshold. Um, and actually what we're seeing is very much a conventional warfare um, conducted by you know, predominantly ground forces. Um, and I, I, I'll end there by really kind of posing a, a question for, for the, the, three, um, the three speakers as to you know, their thoughts on the, the war in Ukraine um, and what that tells us, what they think it, you know, whether it has undermined their assessment um, and the conclusions that they reached in their paper were actually reinforced um, those conclusions about the character of conflict warfare in the 21st century um, and you know taking it forwards what they think this means um, for warfare of the future. Okay. Thank you very much Tracy. Um, if I can encourage, encourage people to put their questions into the uh, into the Q and A box, when we're, I'll get to them. But if we can start, I think with Tracy's question, she's she's challenged all three of our uh, paper givers about how, how much the Ukraine experiences may or may not have changed the, the conclusions they drew. So, if, if we start off with Patrick on that one, and then Dimitri, then Tony. Sure, Andy. Thanks to Tracy for that. Yeah. Um, and also to the other panelists, it was interesting to see how they sort of all linked together. Um, uh, I suppose my own thoughts briefly would just be that um, from the, in terms of the article, like a and network special forces and network warfare, what have I noticed? I've, not a, I've noticed a lot of people having sort of followed the, and also Dimitri would probably, you know, tap in on this as well, but having followed this idea of uh, information, war and, um, you know, 
uh, the the big books of like war and 104 war and 140 characters, which sort of um, uh, you know identified this happening as as far back as to well as far back as Mumbai, really, you know, in terms of like a public response on the internet to conflict, and then you know clearly in the Arab Spring. Um, a lot of people uh, have been looking at Ukraine and going, oh, this is all, it's the first information war. And it's like, no, it's not. It's maybe at a bigger scale or maybe it's the first time you've noticed it, but it's been going on. Uh, and as Dimitri says, you know, heavily in nearly every conflict since 2008, when guess what, you know, it was a year after the iPhone. So, um, uh, so I, I, in one way, I don't, I, I see maybe the difference in scale and intensity, but, uh, but not so much as, as anything new. And I suppose my own article, um, what do I think in terms of special forces there? Well, I, like I'm not privy to, you know, classified information about the use of special forces in Ukraine or not. Um, and, uh, but I, um, I, I do think that the, what we see that is networked in the warfare, particularly if you look at the way the Ukraine Ministry of Defense is asking citizens to upload geolocated tags and images of Russian, um, of Russian kit and, 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 you know, formations, etc. That is new-ish, it seems to me. Um, it still falls into that network sharing uh, you know information um and i guarantee you the way that it's uh then used would be centralized and decentralized and and post fortist as it were uh, the way the military responds to that um but uh and i also think it's it that's blurred the lines between civilian saboteur uh and uh you know military intelligence gatherer so that would be a couple of thoughts on on sort of what we touched on i'll leave it to dimitri to, to pick up on that thank you um yeah, thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you, Tracy. Um, that's that is an excellent question. So, what we see today is, in I would say, both similar and different to what I observed with the Karabakh War. So, what is different is that this is a conflict which is so very different in media intensity. Karabakh War, barely anybody wrote about it, barely anybody knew about it, or could really explain what it is about. Ukraine has been on the news for a while. Um, ever since the um, the crisis in 2014, and then um, more more recently, again and again and again. So this is very much on the public agenda. Our audiences are familiar with it, so there's not so much a task for diasporas to explain what this is or why this matters, um, because audiences are already mobilized. And by audiences here, I mean third party audiences, audiences which are distant from the conflict and not parties of it. But uh, what similarities that we can see, I think, is that um, this warfare, the participatory warfare, dissemination, engagement with information on social media is very much monologic still. So you have one side expressing their view and not really engaging the opponent. Moreover, the opponent is drowned, the opponent is deliberately disengaged. So, for example, what, what I observed in the, in the Karabakh war was that uh, participants, the Armenian diasporans with whom I spoke, uh, they would say they would never engage or even dislike or put, post an angry emoji, for example, to the opponent's side, because that would algorithmically push the opponent's comment up. So what they needed is to like and comment on every Armenian post, for example, and completely ignore the Azerbaijani posts so that they are drowned and moved all the way down to the bottom. So that any third party participants, audiences, say from the UK, who come into the uh, Twitter thread or um, who look at the uh, news comments on the media, they don't see any Azerbaijani comments because they're all the way down. So the battle was very much algorithmic. It was about non-engagement deliberately. And that's how social media has started to shape narrative wars is that there are no they're no longer wars about the you know the argument or proof uh, verification counterproof etc but very much about um shouting in the space and drowning the opponent and um what i think we are going to see further on in in, in now and in future contexts as well is that publics are going to be more and more cautious about what they post online in the sense that um that be diasporas or be it, uh, people from the countries themselves um, living in the conflict zones or very much near conflict zones, again, because the internet becomes more regulated and uh, th there could be repercussions, for example, for, uh, for people posting or reposting particular information. So in that sense, um, participatory online warfare um, with the uh, participation of, of, of publics is going to be um, is going to have these consequences.
Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it here and uh, pass on to Anthony. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> well, a couple of things. Firstly, give up the day job as a strategist was the first thing that the, the, uh, uh, the Ukraine war taught me. I, I was confidently predicting that Putin would not invade because obviously I look, you looked at the military problem, you thought, there's no way this is going to work. This is going to work. And so I, I presumed that there was not going to be any invasion. Mm. Luckily, I'm not a professor of strategy. Otherwise, I think I would have had to hand in my resignation after that. Um, but what I would say without wanting to be too, um, you know, too appallingly academic and sanctimonious is actually, I mean, obviously the work that I did on uh, for the for international affairs on, on insurgency, the article that I produced there, was part of a much wider program of work on urban warfare and, the, and I published a book last summer on it. And that book looked much more at the wider question, both insurgency, but also interstate war. And of course, you know, I absolutely applied the idea of a, um, a, a, a an arithmetic of urban conflict that as com as uh, troops numbers decline, both in terms of insurgency and interstate warfare, it was much more likely that conflict would converge on cities that armies can't form fronts anymore. So that where do they end up? They end up converging on the decisive operational locations and the key terrain in the theatre. Where are those locations? Overwhelmingly in urban areas. So actually, without wanting, as I say, to be too sanctimonious about the whole thing, the actual, although the horror of the Ukraine war obviously has been a shock to me and a shock to everybody, um, it's actual basic geometries where there's been a convergence and coalescence on key sites, Kyiv, Kharkiv, um, Sloviansk now, Severodonetsk, and of course Mariupol, that actually has not surprised me. And, and you know, as I say, it's, I think it's evidence that corroborates the kind of argument that I was making in this article, um, that numbers matter and that something pretty profound has gone on in terms of warfare. And it's not, it's not you know, um, high technology, it's fundamental sociological facts of the size and densities of groups, the size and densities here of military groups make a profound impact on the character of war itself. And so I'm afraid to say I, I wasn't surprised and haven't been surprised uh, by the horrors that have unfolded because the minute you move into the urban domain, of course, who is the prime victim? It's the civilians. So, you know, the only regret is in a way I was at least half correct and maybe more than half correct. Thank you, Tony. I've got 10 questions, four of which are specifically to Dimitri. So I'm going to give the list of four questions for Dimitri out and then ask a general question, giving time for Dimitri to think about all of the four questions he's got by passing on to by doing a gen, more general couple ones to Tony and to Patrick, if I can. So I'll read the Dimitri ones out first. OK, first question. Any assessment from your study of the actual impact of the cyber wars on the actual physical conflict outcome? So basically, how does it actually affect the, the ultimate of physical outcome of the, of the conflict? Um, second one uh, links into the uh, Palestinian conflict and looking at how and various social media cam elements are banning individuals and so forth. And how much have we seen the role of sense um, companies like Microsoft and so forth in becoming an, another dimension to our, the cyber wars that we're seeing in, in terms of who they let to speak and who they let banned from speaking. Third question I've got for you, so I'm scrolling down. Um, on online global info, info politics, how much of it is about preparing the minds for the conflict, closing down independent media, closing, creating a narrative, brainwashing people? Are there any studies on this? And the fourth question I've got for you uh, is, uh, the research seems to me mainly discuss the agency of the diaspora, which is fascinating as a multi-ethnic student coming from American roots. When conducting the research, has any clues about actual support and inducement from great powers such as the US and Russia towards the diaspora and any other agents in the cyber warfare? So there's the four questions. Dimitri, why do you think about all of that? 
and how you're going to respond to that, I shall go back and ask Patrick and um, Tony, and if Tracy wants to come in. Um, the majority of the papers still speak to quite a status militarist global north hegemonic perspective of war and conflict in the 21st century. Yet the distribution of conflict and war has been sharp, moved sharply to and within the global south. Can the panelists speak, panelists speak to the new research situated here? The second more general question, decentralized warfare strategy, will it mean more atrocities and people being more fiercer and less humane? So start off with Patrick and then move on to Tony and then Dimitri having had four questions to think about, if that's okay. And Tracy, if you'd like to come in, just so. So Patrick. Um, look, in a nutshell, I can't really, you know, this this article, in terms of like the non-hegemonic forces, yes, there's was, is, we'll see how it's corrected with Syria in terms of um, casualties and now Ukraine and Nagorno-Karabakh. So, um, uh, but yes, in, in before then, there was obviously the, the uh, number of casualties and the number of conflicts were uh, higher in the global south. Um, but, you know, I was looking at uh, Western Special Forces transformation and particularly the US. So it was just selection bias from the topic, really, rather than um, anything, uh, you know, situated within that literature. Um, and, and the other question, atrocities. Uh, well, listen, atrocities are, you know, you could argue that atrocities are a problem of a lack. Look, let's look at the Russians, you know, a lack of uh, NCOs, a lack of centralized command, a lack of direction, a lack of leadership. Uh, I don't, if you had highly trained decentralized soldiers like the uh, US uh, Special Forces, um, you know, I would argue, well, I would actually know, I would, I, the facts speak for themselves, they commit less atrocities than um, the uh, Russians. So, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a, um, uh, prima facie cause. Thank you, Patrick. Tony? Yeah, um, yes, on the, I mean, accepted that in terms of the sort of empirical base of what I talked to, it was more, I mean, certainly some of them, I tended to focus on campaigns from um, Western and indeed Russian uh, forces. Um, but uh, in terms of the wider research, definitely, you know, I've definitely looked at, uh, at, at conflicts you might call global South conflicts, including, in fact, a pretty deep interest in terms of what's happening inside um, South American cities, uh, which is pretty interesting, to put it mildly. Um, so, I mean, I absolutely take the point of the empirical uh, limitation of the article. I mean, it's a necessary limitation of anyone's piece of work. There's always an empirical limit. Um, in term, but but I, would, I would put forward the thesis that, um, you know, the broad arguments I'm making about urbanization of insurgency in this piece. And maybe, um, again, we'd need to be careful, but maybe in terms of the urbanization of warfare, of, of interstate warfare too, um, these things are actually um, relevant and applicable to the global South um, in pretty similar ways. I mean, if we look at high intensity, um, high intensity fights in the global South, so, you know, for instance, the Libyan civil, civil war, uh, Yemen, um, Philippines. Um, and as I say, I've mentioned um, South America. It's not a war, but there's constant standoff in, in major urban areas in terms of, uh, of super gangs, etc. Um, the kinds of dynamics that I'm trying to identify, that convergence on urban areas, heavy fighting for urban areas, um, the creation of no-go uh, areas in those urban areas, which then are fought over, I think actually I would suggest they are they are born out. I mean, there's obviously places and theatres in which there's uh, there's other patterns at work. Um, you know, um, for instance, you know, um, uh, India, Pakistan, those kind of conflicts don't look like they're going to end up being particularly urbanised. But but I would actually affirm that the kind of processes that I'm talking about. Um, so so it's a very good point. And and you know, I, I'd obviously as someone interested in urban, I'd be pretty interested in more and more work being done everywhere on it. Um, in terms of the atrocity point, yeah, I mean, uh, yes, I take a sort of grim view of atrocities that it's a sort of shadow of warfare and it, it, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's a situational dynamic of a conflict and the higher the, the intensity of the conflict, the more likely it is that either by design or accident, um, there will be atrocities around the edges of it, or even right in the centres of it. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I mean, obviously one would deplore the atrocities that are going on in Ukraine completely, obviously. Um, but, but on another level, um, you know, our job is to try and explain them, not to excuse them, to explain them. And, and as I say, I would explain them in situational terms. Um, I mean, as Patrick said, I think in terms of the Russians, I think, you know, you put an ill-disciplined force that's being taking heavy casualties inside an urban area, the evidence, the historical evidence would suggest that force is likely to start abusing and killing and murdering civilians in its in its in its grasp, essentially. Thanks. Before I bring in Dimitri, just to advertise that all three papers are open access, so free to read, and links to them are in the chat function. And also, there's a link to the um, archival collection or more. Dimitri. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, excellent questions. Um, starting with Lawrence's question first about the impact of. Um, online social media activism by diasporas on the physical conflict outcome. So this is very, very, very difficult to measure uh, because how, how, in a sense, you have an individual diaspora member posting through the, the social media account, personal social media account, um, say posting 20 posts a day about the conflict. How does that impact the war itself? That is a really difficult question. But what I did in my research is not measure that impact, but rather um, analyze and ask the participants in that war itself, um, how do they perceive their impact to be? Um, and one of the important things that I discovered was that considerations of effectiveness were not a motivation for engaging in social media activism. So as, as some of the participants phrased it, um, I'm doing it not because this is effective, but because I couldn't bear not doing it. So very much this became a tool of empowerment. The only thing, the only meaningful, meaningful thing, apart from fundraising, that diaspora members could do from a distance is fighting an information war, uh, promoting the narrative, amplifying voices, mobilizing global publics. And in that sense, their view of effectiveness was mixed. So they reported some success, um, some success to, for example, get media to redact their stories or even uh, limited policy change for, say, Canadian government or US government about their stance on the war. But they, they didn't see them themselves making an immediate difference. Many of them spoke about the cumulative effect, like, for example, we don't react to everything we see on social media, but it builds up. So people became more and more aware because of their actions. But quite a few of them reported negative things as well, negative outcomes, such as uh, many of them felt that this participation in online activism transformed their view of, of politics and friendships, led to disconnections. Because, for example, some friends didn't respond to calls to repost, or um, they, they saw a conflict of interest living in a NATO country, for example, which indirectly, uh, because Turkey is a NATO member and Turkey was actively in support of Azerbaijan in the war, sort of even paying taxes within the United States became an issue for some of the participants because they saw that their money is contributing to the actual defeat of Armenia in, um, in the Karabakh conflict. So there, there was a mix, mix um, of, of different um, outcomes that were reported by the participants. Um, there was also a question about the, the powers and how, for example, the US, Russia, how the governments and great powers, how they contribute to, to this. Um, again, um, from what the participants told me, there were some attempts where the governments, the Azerbaijani or the Armenian government, would actually imp impress upon diasporas that this is important, that the information aspect is important, do take part, do promote the, um, the uh, respective sides narrative. And of course, there is a state investment into social media, in, into bots, into trying to shape and manipulate um, social media discussions about war. But what, what we can also see is massive ordinary people, um, massive input into that social media activism, grassroots, not centralized, not organized. Um, and um, so this is not entirely dependent on, say, government stimulation or um, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, diasporas are activated by governments. No, because they, they are such a decentralized actor in this warfare. Um, there was a question about literature on um, on um, closing down media, on preparing for war, etc. So yes, there is literature on mobilizing, on, 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 for example, using media to mobilize for war or using information for public mobilization. There's also literature on authoritarian powers and how authoritarian states wage warfare and how they treat information there. So yeah, I would encourage you to, to have a look at those literatures as well. And um, there was a question somewhere, um, I think it disappeared 
but there was a question about what this means for peace building, which I think was a fascinating question, uh, because one of the things that um, uh, that struck me when I was doing the interviews is how this became the social media aspect became a war in itself. So it continued to be uh, so participants continued to fight it even after the war itself was over, and um, they saw a possible victory, even though Armenia suffered defeat in the physical war. And um, the question then would be, how do you de-escalate? How do you demobilize diaspora members' publics who start fighting online about what constitutes the truth of this war? Because again, the, uh, the information about the war, the current information then feeds into memory about the conflict, how that conflict is understood, how it's remembered, how it is passed on to generations. So the repercussions of information and conflict are way beyond the moment of today. And so um, peace building initiatives here, we can see the emergence of some of them, for example, how to avoid hate speech online, because much of it is um, accompanied by um, hostile um, statements, by threats. There were physical threats made to participants in this, um, um, to Armenian or Azerbaijani participants who shared information about the war on social media. So peace building started with um, avoidance of hate speech and initiatives to fact check information, etc. But effectively, there's a major question about how do you de-escalate from this? So thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. I'm conscious of time. We've got uh, four minutes left. I've got five questions. So I'm going to read all five questions out and then give each panelist 30 seconds to answer how they want to. Um, first question for me, for me, Ian. How do the panel, panel see conflict developing in terms of the wider damage caused by global trade interconnectedness and how will intervention thresholds change? Second question from Chris. I don't understand how the growth of digital technological networks will lead to less network leadership and management when the soldier officer will have more access to information in real time, therefore will have greater control over the battlefield and the strategy that sits behind it. Surely this will change in how warfare is connected, conducted means centralization is more a threat. Third question was about crowdfunding appeal for things like give me a jet fighter uh, does, will this have any traction in the future in terms of how we will see social media and other forms of fundraising to conduct warfare? Fourth question, which of the new patterns developments in modern warfare is more important and crucial for winning in modern conflict? And the last question, mainstream media journalism doesn't seem to be generally able to filter out manufactured, in inverted commas, media content for disinformation purposes when it comes to international crises and consensus building through media narratives. Are there any thoughts from about this? So with those five questions and all the other feedback, I'll give the last word to each of the panelists in 30 seconds each, starting with Patrick, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Um, listen, I'll just take question two because it's directly related to me. Um, Chris, thanks for that. Yeah, listen, four points essentially. First of all, I had five minutes to explain a complex topic. Um, it's much more clear in the paper. Um, second one. My central argument is I'm arguing that in the most sent, most networked force to date, yeah, that we know of US special forces in Iraq with all the intel they had, it was still post Fordist organization. Yeah. Unlike what the literature said and unlike what was self-reported by a lot of the operators. Um, second, what I argue is what is networked is intelligence, doesn't uh, information that doesn't doesn't change. And thirdly, what I actually don't say, this doesn't mean that we're not going in a network direction. Um, I explore what that network direction would look like. Too much of the literature has said this is going to be frictionless. And actually, if you look at the generals who are trying to plan for this, they're like, no, 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 it's going to be, as I said, binary pulses. We're going to have net network connectivity and then we're going to lose it because of the nature of warfare. So that's what I'd say about that. Thank you, Patrick. Tony. Um, yeah, these questions are impossible to answer. Third question. I'll just say, look, um, don't believe any hype. War is going to be as horrible tomorrow as it is today in Mariupol. Um, and the, as analysts, it's our duty to communicate and to analyze the horrific elements of warfare. And that, you know, states, forces, humans will be driven to extremes that we might find surprising in the future, in the near future. Uh, and that we need to be, aware, notwithstanding all of the extraordinary technological developments, we need to be aware that fundamental visceral element 
of warfare because we are just social animals will will remain and it will remain tomorrow and it'll be the same in 2050 and it will be the same in 2021 20, uh, 50 if we if any of us are still here dimitri last Thank words you. yep um i'll just say this that it's not only the wars and the ways we fight wars that are changing it's also the way we consume information that is changing so today increasingly we consume news on social media we come across information on social media. Our retention span is very, very short. Um, very often on social media, we do not go beyond the tweet sized bit of information or the headline. So what really I think is going to matter and based on, um, on interviews with the participants is the algorithms. Um, the algorithms, because they determine the visibility of information to wider publics. So if we are going to look at the aspect of war which mobilizes international public opinion, and diasporas play a role in this and social media plays a role in this. So this online narrative war, algorithms are going to be determining who is winning that narrative because that will determine whose story is heard. Thank you very much. And can I thank all the, the um, speakers, fantastic papers. I would really encourage you to go and read them all and also look at the archive collection. Thank you all for keeping to time. They all highlighted the challenge of predicting the future. I think that they alluded to one of the problems there. And if I go back to the uh, flag up the International Archive Affairs Archive, there's a great piece in this July 1939 edition of International Affairs by a certain General Weygand, looking at the future and how France would defend against Germany. For those who are not sure who he was, he was Chief of the Staff of the French Army, retired, and then was brought back in May 1940 after the Germans had broken through um, at Sedan to try and save France. Unfortunately, he didn't. And uh, as they, the rest, as they say, is history. But with that, can I, you join me in a virtual applause for thanking very much for the paper givers and also for participants for, for listening in and attending us. Thank you all. <laughs>